Okay. Okay. <laughs> and we are and we are online. So the hardest part was actually for me to hit the record. Remember to hit the recording button. So okay. So I think actually we can we can start. Let me start. Uh, Welcome everyone to our, let's say, weekly seminar series. And for me, it's a great pleasure to present today, today to introduce today's speaker and also a dear friend, so is Dr. Giulia Cencetti from uh, Bruno Glaser Foundation in, in Trento, in Italy. As you can see, also in Trento, they have, they have sun. Thank you, thank <laughs> you, Giulia, for, for being here. Let me start <laughs> by presenting Dr. Cencetti. Dr. Cincetti actually, actually has a very rich and disciplinary background. She is a physicist by training, and she got a PhD in information engineering from the University of Florence in, um, in Italy. And since then, she has been working on different problems in complex systems. So I'd say that actually is a very good fit for our, for our seminar series. And in particular, she worked on uh, many different problems in uh, dynamical systems on, on complex networks. After her PhD in, um, in Italy, she moved for some months to the Department of Networks and Data Science at the Central European University in, uh, in Budapest, I think, at the, the, at the yes, time. At the time, yes. Now, now, they, now they moved to, to Austria, where actually she started working uh, on an emerging branch of network science, actually the study of higher order interactions of, uh, of network, something that I'm particularly, uh, I'm a particularly fan, I'm a, yeah, I'm a big fan, so. And uh, actually she made, in this period, she made many, many important contributions. Also, she wrote an important review on the topic. So she's an expert if you, after that, if you want to talk with her. And since July, 2019, she joined the Bruno Gesser Foundation as a postdoc. And right now she's working on, let's say, applications of her theoretical knowledge to the, to the study of social system. And this is actually the, the topic of our talk today. And let me finish so I can leave the floor to, to Julia by saying that actually last year she got the 20, 2021 Emerging Researchers Award from the Complex System Society. It actually, it's an award that is given to, to young researchers that made in contra in important contributions in complexity, in complexity science. So let's say she's one of the rising stars of complexity, of complexity science. And without, uh, without uh, I mean, losing too much time, the title of our talk today is Digital Proximity Tracing, uh, Digital Proximity Tracing on Empirical Contact Networks for Pandemic Control. So thank you again, Julia, for being here. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share my screen. OK. Uh, so thank you, thank you for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, I, during my PhD, I was studying network science from uh, a quite theoretical point of view, like dynamical systems, uh, equilibrium stability, stuff like this. And then I wanted to do something more applied, and then that's why I, I came here to Trento at the Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Uh, Trento is, uh, is in the middle of the mountains uh, in the north of Italy and in particular I'm, I joined the, the group uh, MOBS, uh, Mobile uh, and Social Computing Lab, uh, which is the, the office uh, that you can see in this beautiful picture, the only office with the lights off. Uh, which tells you how much we are working. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Actually, I, I wanted to say that um, uh, you, you are all welcome to, to come and visit us uh, whenever you want. Okay, so let's go to the topic that I want to present today. Uh, so this work uh, is a, a project on digital contact tracing and its effect uh, in containing the COVID pandemic. Um, I have to say that this work has been developed during um, spring summer of 2020 uh, when we had no vaccines and we could only count on non-pharmaceutical interventions. And for this reason, uh, here we just focus on isolations and training and, and <clears throat> tracing. Okay, 
So um, first of all, I, I before going into the details of the model, I want to introduce digital contact tracing, um, which unfortunately has not been used so much. Uh, and so you may not know the, the, um, uh, how it works exactly. Um, so digital uh, tracing um, is meant uh, um, to uh, be of support of manual tracing. Uh, manual tracing is uh, um, the tracing that is done by the health authorities when uh, you are, um, <clears throat> you are uh, tested positive and uh, they call you to ask you which are your close contacts, so your cohabitants, friends, family, colleagues and so on, uh, which are the, uh, the people that uh, uh, have the higher probability of being infected by you or having uh, of having infected you. Um, but then digital tracing um, does a, a kind of a complementary job because uh, it, it uh, also records the occasional contacts. So the, the contact, the, all, all the people that you, you couldn't report because you do not know them. Um, for instance, all the people that you meet uh, at the supermarket, on the bus, on the streets, and so on. Um, another difference between manual and digital tracing is that uh, digital tracing is uh, automatic, hence fast, and it doesn't need any workforce. Uh, and so it, it, uh, it works uh, even when uh, uh, there are many cases of COVID and manual contact tracing uh, cannot be properly done, like at the school openings. Um, then digital tracing, um, uh, at least the apps of digital tracing that appeared uh, in Europe and also somewhere else, uh, are based on the DP3T protocol which means uh, decentralized privacy preserving pr proximity tracing. Because um, if in manual tracing, uh, we can trust the health authorities, they, th that uh, uh, they, they will not diffuse our sensible data. Um, in digital contact tracing, um, wh where this work uh, uh, is done by technology, uh, we cannot uh, uh, trust it um, unless uh, we impede to this technology to collect uh, this sensible information. And this is not conspiracy theory because privacy is important. Um, so the first step uh, is uh, of course to anonymize uh, identities by using anonymous IDs. Um, but this is not enough because uh, we know that identities can also be uh, sometimes uh, reconstructed by combining uh, other metadata. Um, and so we need a decentralized system too. Now, I, I want to explain uh, uh, briefly uh, which is the difference between a centralized and the decentralized tracing. Um, for this couple of slides, I, I have to give credit to Marcel Salaté, who explained it uh, very clearly at the last uh, CCS. Um, so the point, we start with centra centralized tracing. So uh, here we, we have uh, a set of users um, where, uh, to, to which I, I gave uh, uh, these fake names from Alice to Grace, but you have to think that these can be anonymous uh, IDs. <clears throat> so let's suppose that uh, Alice um, gets infected. And she, uh, in the last days, she had contacts with Bob, Dan, and Div. Um, when she, she gets infected, she contacts the, the, the central server to say, to, to give her list of contacts. Uh, so the central server can uh, alert uh, Bob, Dan and Dave to, to say that uh, they may have uh, been infected by someone. So uh, the point, the, the, the problem is that uh, with this system, the contact information 
um, reaches the, the central server. And so it can be stored and uh, uh, over time, um, the contact network or at least part of it uh, could be derived and the, and the data could be used also for other purposes. And this, this is also how um, manual tracing works, but uh, it is done by the health authorities, as I was saying before. So when we go to, when we consider instead the decentralized tracing, uh, there is an important difference. We still have a central server, but when Alice gets infected, uh, she doesn't give to the central server her, her list of contacts. She just reports herself. And so the central server um, sends the information that Alice, or at least the user with this uh, anonymous ID, is infected. And uh, it sends the, this information to all the other users. And then, uh, so saying like, uh, look, Alice is infected. So if you have it in your list of contacts, uh, you should uh, quarantine yourself. So all the use actually this is done by the by this is done automatically by the apps that we have uh, on our phones and so the app of Bob Dan and Eve will show a notification uh, while on the other uh, phone uh, phones uh, nothing will happen so uh, in, in this case uh, the contact information uh, are um, stored only on the personal phones and are never shared with anyone. And the only information that the central server knows is the anonymous ID uh, of uh, who signals themselves as infected. Okay, so I, I hope this is clear, but uh, if not, uh, uh, you're welcome to, to ask uh, and I will explain it again. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, uh, from now on, uh, when uh, I, I will talk about tracing, I will mean digital contact tracing. Um, of course, digital contact tracing cannot work alone because it also needs um, other containment measures, like also manual tracing. But uh, uh, these, uh, um, all the other containment measures will be uh, modelized uh, um, as a general reduction of infectiousness. While digital contact tracing is considered on top of them to understand uh, its additional effect. Um, okay, so let me explain how uh, our model works. Uh, so let's assume that we have an infected individual. Um, once we discover that this person is infected, we isolate uh, them. Uh, we call epsilon i the fraction of infected individuals that we are able to self uh, to to isolate. Um, epsilon i is a parameter that stays between zero and one, and it is never one because this uh, parameter takes into account first that not all the infected individuals are discovered, uh, also because uh, many of them are asymptomatic. And second, uh, that not everybody is able to self-isolate, self even knowing that uh, is infected. Um, then, uh, once someone is being isolated, we trace uh, their contacts uh, to find who may have been infected by this person. Uh, so we call epsilon t the fraction of these contacts uh, that are uh, correctly traced. Um, then all traced contacts will be preventively quarantined and preventively means that uh, um, not all uh, of these um, uh, contacts will be actually infected. Uh, some, some of them can be also susceptible. Um, and then if they develop symptoms or are tested positive during quarantine, um, they become isolated. If not, at the end of quarantine, they are released. Um, then when people are isolated or in quarantine, 
uh, we assume that, do, that, that they do not have any interactions with others. And the difference between quarantines and the isolations is that uh, all the isolated people are actually infected for sure, while quarantined people can be infected or susceptible. Um, and the susceptible people that are in quarantine are, co are called uh, false positive. But I will come back on these uh, uh, later. So the idea uh, of evaluating a long, the, the long-term behavior of an epidemic based on these two parameters, uh, epsilon i and epsilon t, uh, comes from uh, Christoph Fraser and collaborators. So um, there was a first paper on PNAS of 2004, um, and then uh, uh, th there has been a follow-up uh, in, uh, in 2020 on science by Ferretti et al, uh, which is applied to COVID. Um, so in, in these works, uh, they develop a mathematical model uh, to describe the evolution of the number of infected uh, individuals uh, in a generic um, homogeneously mixed population by, and assuming an exponential growth of infected. So I, I will uh, show uh, some equations now, but don't worry that they are not uh, many. And uh, it, it is just to give an idea of how the model works. So. Um, the work of uh, Fraser, Ferretti and collaborators is based on the Van Furster equations, uh, which assume that uh, uh, the infectiousness depends on the age since infection. So they have this uh, variable y of t and zero, which represents the number of new infected uh, at time t. And this number is obtained by, um, with an integral from uh, between zero and t of uh, um, y, t, and tau, which, are the, num which is the number of old infected. So the, infect the, the infected that, that um, has been infected a time tau ago and multiplied by uh, a function beta of t, which represents the infectiousness um, of an infected people uh, given the time tau since uh, this person is infected. So you can see the, the curve uh, on the right. Actually, here there are uh, four different curves because they, they consider um, different contributions to this uh, infectiousness because there is the symptomatic, presymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic, and uh, environmental infectiousness. But the point is that uh, it just gives you um, the, the probability that uh, um, uh, a person, an infected person can uh, infect others. So uh, at, at um, time zero, when this person is infected, uh, it's inf his or her infectiousness is zero. Then it increases in time, it reaches a maximum uh, around uh, um, uh, after um, five days, um, and then it goes down again, okay? Uh, then what uh, uh, Fraser um, and collaborators did uh, was to introduce in these equations the concept of isolations. And so they... Um, added this term one minus epsilon i s of tau, uh, where, where s of tau is the probability of symptom onset after tau days from infection, or, or, or um, in other words, uh, it is the probability that an infected person is identified. And this is multiplied uh, by um, epsilon i. So you see that for epsilon i equal to zero, we go back to the uh, original situation. Um, but the, the contribution of um, a, a value, uh, an epsilon i, which is different from zero, is uh, uh, to reduce the infectiousness of this, um, in this population, okay? Then, they also, uh, they complicated uh, more this equation in order to introduce also the effect of tracing. So you can see that in the last equation, uh, you have epsilon i and epsilon t. I won't go into the details of this uh, equation. Also, the variables are a bit different, but I just, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of how the model works. 
So uh, then what they, what they did uh, was to find an asymptotic solution for this equation. So a solution um, which is valid for time, which goes to infinity. And uh, with this solution, they draw um, this sort of phase space that you see on the left with epsilon i and epsilon t, where um, they identify two regions, uh, the green region where the epidemic is controllable and which correspond to the higher values of epsilon i and epsilon t, and an orange region where the epidemic is not controllable. Okay. But then um, this, um, this solution, the, the, the asymptotic solution that they found um, is possible only if we assume uh, a specific form of the, um, for the growth of infections. And actually they assume um, an exponential growth. Now, uh, an, exp an exponential growth uh, is a good uh, approximation uh, for the first phases of an epidemic but uh, not uh, when uh, um, other containment measures are in place, like masks, uh, physical distancing, and vaccines, and so on. So for instance, now COVID is not growing exponentially, fortunately. Um, so what we did with uh, our team uh, was to generalize this mathematical framework by discretizing times, uh, so that we don't need a, an asymptotic solution, but we will just give a long-term one. Um, and this allows us to possibly consider any general form for the uh, epidemic growth. So what we did um, was to, in practice, was to uh, restructure and generalize the, the mathematical framework uh, so as the, that we can avoid this um, assumption, any assumption on the functional form of the epidemic uh, growth. And in this way, we are able, we are able to apply this setting to any um, possible um, phase of, of the epidemic. Um, moreover, we modified the model uh, to include uh, a variable number of asymptomatic cases and a variable delay in isolations. Because in order to have a, a realistic setting, uh, we, we thought that a, a delay was important because it is not true in real life that when you discover that you are infected, you isolate immediately and immediately trace your contacts and your contacts quarantine. Um, and then uh, uh, we, we also uh, considered uh, a variable reproduction number R. And this is uh, particularly useful uh, if we want uh, to consider a reduced variable, uh, um, sorry, a reduced value of R with respect to uh, R0, which is typical of the disease. Um, which is useful uh, if we want to uh, take into account all the additional containment strategies like uh, physical distancing, masks, uh, and so on. Okay. Then um, we also uh, provided a realistic quantification of uh, the tracing ability epsilon t. And we did so by simulating uh, the epidemic with contact tracing on uh, real world data sets. So we considered uh, three different data sets, um, a university campus from the Copenhagen Network Study, uh, and then a workplace and a high school from the Social Patterns Project. So these data sets um, uh, contain uh, data uh, about uh, the physical interactions of uh, uh, people in these different settings. And so they can be described as uh, temporal networks, where uh, at each time step, uh, we have the static network of interactions between uh, people at that time, and then uh, it evolves in time. So um, we, in our model, epsilon t becomes uh, an empirically estimated quantity, um, which directly depends uh, on the contact network. Um, and then uh, this uh, value epsilon t can be used 
can be inserted into the mathematical model to evaluate uh, um, its effect on the COVID spreading. So in details, what we do is to, uh, in parallel of, of the, uh, um, to the mathematical model, we uh, simulate uh, an agent-based model on the um, uh, temporal network that we have from uh, data. Um, and so we, in this agent-based model, we simulate uh, uh, the COVID spreading. So we start uh, at the first uh, time step um, by um, choosing a random node of this network and uh, assuming that this node is infected. And we observe how the, the, the infection spreads. Uh, then at each time step, we know uh, who is infected and we are allowed to uh, isolate just a fraction epsilon i of them. Um, then for these, uh, um, individuals that we uh, isolate, um, we, we want to trace their contacts. Uh, now, in, in the model, we know exactly who infected whom, but we suppose that we don't know it, and we try to guess which of these contacts uh, could, be, uh, could have been contagious based on some intuitions. And I will come back to these intuitions uh, in a moment. So then, uh, what we do is to uh, compare uh, contagious, the, the, the contagious contacts that we identified with those that really uh, took place in the numerical simulation. And from the comparison, we obtain epsilon t. So now epsilon t is a measure of uh, our ability um, to trace the, um, uh, the, the contagious contacts. Okay, um, then we um, also assumed in the numerical simulations that the probability of a contagion event uh, occurring uh, during an interaction between a susceptible and an infected individual also depends uh, on the duration and the proximity of the contact along with other epidemiological variables, of course. And this in particular can be done when we have uh, uh, the Bluetooth uh, um, um, technology for uh, data, as we have in the Copenhagen Network study, and uh, which is the technology um, uh, that, uh, that, that work uh, with, with, the, um, uh, with the contact tracing apps. Um, so what we, we do in, in particular is to mod modify the infectiousness probability uh, distribution. So first, I, um, before I was showing um, the, the function beta of tau, uh, which is the infectiousness probability as a function of the time since infection. And then we multiply this function for two other functions. One is a beta exposure of E, which is the dependency on contact duration. And you can see here below uh, on the left, the cumulative distribution of beta exposure. So here you can see three different curves from the, the blue one, which is the most pessimistic to the uh, pink one, which is the most uh, optimistic. So it, it, in the blue one, it, you see that um, the, um, uh, we reach the 90% of uh, contagion after uh, a contact with duration one hour. With the yellow one, we have the same um, probability after two hours and uh, um, with the pink one after four hours. So these are three different uh, uh, scenarios. Um, in our uh, work, I mean, in the, in the experiments that I will show you um, today, we, we use the, the yellow curve. And then we also have a probability distribution beta dist, which is the uh, infectiousness uh, uh, as a function of the distance uh, between the people where, uh, when they were interacting. And so here again, you can see the cumulative um, uh, function. And again, we, we chose the, the yellow one. Now, uh, let me open a parenthesis. Um, on digital contact tracing, which uh, um, 
um, is, um, I mean, uh, digital contact tracing is not meant to trace uh, and quarantine all the contacts of an infected individuals, uh, individual. And this is different. Uh, um, we, this is one of the main differences with uh, the manual tracing. Because when we rely on the Bluetooth technology, um, we know that this, uh, um, I mean, uh, the Bluetooth can, can um, uh, record the contact even with a person who is very far away, who uh, just um, uh, interacted with us for one second uh, and, uh, and then went away. And so uh, if we um, took all the contacts that uh, uh, a Bluetooth uh, technology uh, could record, this would correspond to uh, quarantine the entire population. But uh, um, th this is not the case because uh, this would um, vanify the effect of tracing. Because tracing is meant to select uh, the people that have a major probability of being infected. And uh, um, so how um, can we guess which contacts are to be considered at risk and which are not? So we come back to the intuitions that I was talking before. But now we have these two important information for each contact. We have duration and proximity. And uh, so if we consider that they have a role in contagions, uh, they can have a role also in tracing. So what we do? is to design uh, appropriate policies um, in terms of what we want to consider a risky contact. Um, so we are able uh, to implement a tracing which doesn't necessarily uh, imply a massive preventive uh, quarantine of the population. Um, and th these policies are based uh, on duration and proximity, and we define uh, thresholds uh, to discriminate between risky and uh, non-risky contacts. So for instance, we have defined uh, five different policies from green to red, from the most permissive to the most restrictive. And um, so in the, in the plot uh, on the left, uh, you, you can see that uh, here we have some blue points which correspond to the interactions in the Copenhagen network study with their exposure, so their duration and their uh, signal strength. Um, ah, sorry, I didn't say it before, that uh, um, with the Bluetooth, we can uh, uh, obtain duration and, um, and distance because, the, well, the duration is easy because the Bluetooth uh, records uh, all the times at which a duration, a, a, an interaction uh, took place. Um, and so we can obtain duration from this. Um, and then uh, it also records the signal strength. And the signal strength uh, can be um, somehow related to the um, proximity between uh, the, the two people, even if uh, the conversion signal strength uh, distance is not uh, mm, trivial, uh, but it's an approximate conversion, okay. Um, but this is what we have, so we have to rely on this. So um, in this case, you can see that um, in the plot with the blue points, uh, I, um, we also draw this, um, the, the, the different policies. So for instance, uh, you see that uh, the green policy, which is the most permissive, um, considers at risk only the, the contacts that, uh, uh, that are contained in, in, the, in the green box. Um, so just a few of the, the contacts that happened in, in this uh, data set. Then the yellow policy, which is a bit more restrictive, uh, correspond to a, a bit larger uh, box and, and so on, okay? Now, we, um, we, we consider different policies because we want to consider different scenarios. Also because we know that uh, uh, more restrictive policies work better in containing contagions, um, but they also imply more false positive. Uh, well, uh, with false positive, I uh, mean people that are not infected, but are erroneously considered uh, at risk and uh, quarantined. 
And we know that this uh, implies um, a, a, a big socioeconomic uh, problem. And so we want to minimize the number of false positives. But at the same time, of course, we also want to minimize the number of false negatives, which are the infected individuals who are um, considered not at risk and not quarantined. And so with these uh, different policies, we want to uh, find the one that, uh, or, or the ones that minimize uh, the uh, both uh, false positive and false negative. So to give you a recap, um, we have uh, a general mathematical model to evaluate the long-term behavior of the pandemic. We use real contact data in order to um, evaluate the tracing ability epsilon t that we can then insert into the general mathematical model. Then we consider contagions based on duration and proximity, and we define policies that uh, trying to minimize uh, false positive and false negative in quarantine. So mm, let's see some results. Um, similar to the work of Fraser, we can obtain a phase space with epsilon i and epsilon t by identifying the region where the epidemic is controllable, in, in our case, the blue one, the one on top um, uh, right of each plot, and the region where it is not controllable, the gray one. So here I'm showing three different scenarios. Um, from the most optimistic to the most pessimistic. So uh, on the left, we have uh, the case with the reproduction number equal to 1.2 and uh, a delay in isolations and tracing of two days. Then in the middle, uh, we have R uh, equal to 1.5. So you see that uh, the blue region is uh, a bit reduced while the gray region becomes larger. And then we have R equal to two. Um, and with also uh, an increased delay of three days. And you see that in this case, in order to have a controllable uh, situation, we really need the high values for epsilon i and epsilon t. But now let, let's focus on the uh, scenario in the, in the middle. Um, as I was saying before, the difference um, between our work and, and one of Fraser is that uh, we consider that uh, not all the values of uh, epsilon t are possible. Uh, since, I was, uh, as I was saying before, epsilon t, um, first, it depends on epsilon i, because the more people we are able to isolate and the more um, people we are able to trace. And second, it depends on the contact network. And that's why we obtain it empirically. So you can see that, uh, for instance, for uh, the Copenhagen network study with an up adoption of 40% of the population, um, we have that for epsilon i equal to 0 0.2, uh, we have a, a very small uh, value of epsilon t that we obtain. Then we can increase epsilon i, and we see that epsilon t increases uh, as well. But uh, um, we, we really need a, a high value of epsilon i in order to um, overcome the threshold and go into, into the controllability region. But this is what we obtain under these conditions. But this is uh, what we obtain with the uh, first policy, the green one, which is the most permissive. The situation is um, better if we consider the second policy. And this is the, the situation with all the, the five different policies. So now we observe that uh, the first value of epsilon i for which the epidemic is controllable is 0 0.8. And just uh, the most restrictive policies are working. So for this value, we uh, plot uh, the number of uh, false negative and false positive in time. And we see uh, that for, for the different policies. And so we see that uh, for um, what concerns the, the false negative, um, the green policy corresponds to um, a, a larger number of cases. So um, more people that uh, are infected, but not in quarantine. 
with respect to the other policies. So the, more, the, the, the policies which are more restrictive are working better on this uh, point of view. But uh, they, are work, uh, they are working better at the expense of the number of false positive. Um, because uh, um, we see from the plot on the right that uh, the, um, the more restrictive is a policy and the higher number of false, uh, the higher is the number of false positive. Uh, and so uh, how, how can we uh, find a balance, sorry. Uh, how can we find the balance uh, between these two, um, uh, two quantities that we want to minimize at the same time? Well, what we did um, was to um, plot the number of uh, false negative and uh, versus the total quarantine population and from for the different policies and from this plot we see that uh, the, the most permissive policy imply too many um, false negative uh, which means that many infected are not traced and quarantined while the most restrictive policies are, um, are able to keep the pandemic under control, but uh, at the cost of useless quarantines. And so the optimal balance is found, uh, is found in the middle, corresponding to this sort of elbow, uh, when we consider at risk only the contacts that happen within uh, two or three meters and uh, longer than 15, 20 minutes. Um, and this is uh, um, one of the main results of, of our work, uh, and not, uh, not only uh, the results, but, uh, but the way uh, that allows us to find uh, which are the optimal thresholds, uh, threshold for risk under specific conditions. Because, of course, if we change the, the conditions, the, also the balance will change. Now here I, I show uh, some of the um, some different scenarios for the um, the phase space with epsilon i and epsilon t. So we here we consider different values of r and different values of the up adoption. So for instance, for r equal to two, we have a very um, pessimistic scenario where uh, we see that the gray region is very large and so the, the colored points are not able to go into the controllability uh, region, even if uh, uh, um, enlarging the up adoption, uh, which is uh, 20, 40 and 60 percent, enlarging the up adoption make these um, uh, points um, go up, but they are not able to to, to control the epidemic under these conditions. Then the, the situation is way better with uh, R equal to 1.5 and uh, um, increasingly better with uh, R equal to 1.2. Um, inter interestingly, uh, we observe uh, that the effect of digital contact tracing uh, is important, uh, even if the app uh, is uh, scarcely adopted. Um, however, uh, an app adoption of 40% uh, will be sufficient to keep new cases uh, under control and, and to progressively reduce them, given that uh, other safety measures are in place, like masks, physical distancing, and so uh, that we can have a reduced uh, reproduction number. Now I have some additional results, but uh, uh, Sandro didn't say anything, so I think I can go on because I have I still have some time. Um, okay, so um, I, I was uh, saying before that uh, we included in our model uh, a delay of uh, uh, two day, a delay in order to have uh, a realistic scenario. Um, so in, in the experiments that uh, I was showing before, uh, we used a delay of two days. But uh, since uh, we experienced in real life that this delay might uh, increase, we also wanted to test uh, um, a, um, a longer delay. 
And uh, we discovered that uh, um, it was sufficient to increase the delay from two to three days to reveal a much worse uh, uh, scenario, uh, actually a, catast a catastrophic one. Uh, and so this, uh, this result uh, highlight, highlights uh, uh, again the importance of uh, readiness in implementing uh, testing and isolations. Then another important result uh, concerns uh, privacy. Uh, so we um, also numerically tested a second order tracing, uh, where also um, contacts of contacts of an infected individual are quarantined. Um, this uh, raises the privacy issue because uh, to do so, uh, we all have to have access uh, uh, to the entire network of contacts. So we couldn't count on, the, on a decentralized system. But uh, from our results, we found out that this, so the, the second order tracing, um, determines a useless massive quarantine of the population uh, while failing of, uh, to bring um, any clear beneficial effect in controlling the pandemic. As you can see here from the fact that uh, false positive are increased, uh, going from first to second order tracing, while uh, false negative, uh, yes, they are decreased, but not so much. And so it, it, it appears um, useless. So privacy is safe for our point of view. Um, finally, uh, we also tested the possibility uh, that people reduce their compliance um, if uh, they are notified multiple times and asked to quarantine uh, despite not being infected. Now, this is um, a, a peculiar situation, but uh, it is not rare. Uh, it uh, may have happened uh, also to, to some of you. Uh, so uh, in that case, what, uh, what would you do or what did you do? Um, would you quarantine yourself uh, um, even knowing, even, no, sorry, even thinking that uh, you could be uh, not infected? Um, well, uh, the answer for, for you, uh, I suppose, is yes, of course, uh, because you are an audience of uh, enlightened people. But uh, of course, uh, not everybody thinks the same. And this is uh, uh, what we can call the quarantine dilemma. Uh, so the point uh, is that um, if you trust um, the health authorities, uh, then you are willing uh, to make a small sacrifice for the common good, so not to risk uh, uh, to infect other people and you quarantine yourself. Otherwise, if you have an egoistic point of view, uh, you can prefer a small benefit, so not being quarantined, um, at the expense of the society. So the link with the prisoner's dilemma is clear. Um, I suppose you know the prisoner's dilemma game, and if not, I suggest you to take a look at this uh, uh, explorable of Nikki case where you can actually pay, play, um, and it's super fun. Uh, also, if you know it, uh, I suggest you to take a look at it. Um, and so what we did to quantify the compliance to quarantine, even if already quarantined in the past, um, we uh, relied on, uh, on a paper of 1993 where they actually did an experiment of repeated prisoner's dilemma, so making people uh, play uh, with many other people. And in this um, analysis, they um, quantified how much uh, you are inclined to cooperate, uh, even uh, having been uh, betrayed and at end times. Uh, so we um, used these data for our purpose, and so we uh, assume that uh, um, if your previous quarantine are zero, so it is the first time that you are asked to quarantine, your compliance, so the probability that you uh, quarantine is one. Of course, here I'm talking about the people that uh, uh, decided to adopt the app, because uh, in our model, when um, the people that didn't adopt the app cannot be quarantined. 
Uh, but if you adopt the app, mm, we assume that the first time uh, you are quarantined with probability one, the second time with probability 0 0.86 and so on, uh, always decreasing. Now, let me say that, uh, of course, this uh, would require um, a more accurate quantification. But uh, OK, let's say that this is just an experiment to give an approximate indication. And our indication with um, this reduced compliance is that uh, the um, results uh, are very similar to the case of a constant compliance. They are a bit worse, but not so much. And this confirms uh, uh, somehow the robustness of the method. Then in conclusion, um, this uh, combination of uh, an epidemic model with uh, empirical interaction data uh, allows us to understand the role of digital contact tracing uh, in obtaining a containment uh, for the pandemic. Um, we are uh, able to quantify the effect of tracing and to evaluate policies in terms of uh, functionality and cost. Um, and in general, we think that this uh, could be a, an important tool to take advantage of our uh, digital society for public health. And that's it. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julia, for the ni nice talk. I know that it's quite weird and not feeling, I mean, the, the applause <laughs> up there, but I can assure you that people actually is applauding. So. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay. Thank you so much for the very interesting, uh, the very interesting talk. And uh, also, as usual, we have time. We have five minutes for for questions. So, as usual, I will I would like to ask first our PhD students, our students, if they want to, I encourage them, encourage them to uh, starting with the first with the first question. So guys, don't be don't be shy. If you have questions, just unmute yourself and and talk. Especially PhD students. So, come on. I know. I know that you, Jesus. I know that you have questions. Don't be shy. So, <laughs> okay. If uh, the students are too shy, let's start with let's say with all the rest of the of people. Let me know if someone is interested. Please unmute yourself. So the actual pera, so pera, please. Yeah. I have a question which is a kind of reverse engineering. <laughs> okay. The fact that with rather COVID, I have received no single notification of, of being close to a contagion from anybody in the whole pandemic, me. What, what restrictions imposes on the number of people that has already updated the data? Okay. Sorry, sorry, uh, I, I missed a, a bit. The point is that I have not received any, any information on rather COVID of being close contact of anybody in the whole pandemic, which is completely impossible. Just, just let me let me add one thing. Uh, rather COVID is the. It, this means that rather COVID is not being. Rather COVID is an application in Spain for. It's the Spanish application from the Spanish Ministry Ministry of the Health. So it's. It's not it's to Italian in money, Julia. Just enough. Not having received any information on that means that probably very few people have updated data on rather COVID, and my question is if one can infer a number of the people that has already updated the data, okay? Uh, there will be a limit for that because if most of the people would have updated the data, you should have been received some information with some probability. The fact that I have received no, no single information and nobody that I know that has rather COVID in store has received any notification means that what, what limit can impose on the number of people that are actually uploading the data in data COVID? Yeah, actually, I, I don't know how it worked uh, in Spain, but uh, I think the, the case was, was not so different uh, from Italy, the yeah. Italian case. So almost nobody uh, were, was using the app or, or is still using the app. Uh, it was uh, downloaded in Italy like from 10% um, uh, uh, of the population, but just downloaded. And then I don't know how many, we, we don't know how many people but you really could infer, use them. But, but the fact that there is no, no communication means that the, one can infer the upper limit for the 
for the people who brought in data from it. Yeah, but, but you don't need to infer anything. I mean, there's a, in the Spanish, there's a Spanish website where you can have this, this data. The, the number of people that have actually, uh, you know, written down there or informed the app, it's, it's public. Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, actually, the, the point is that um, uh, in Italy, there was also another problem uh, at the beginning, uh, which was that uh, if you were positive, you couldn't uh, um, uh, report yourself uh, in the app without contacting first uh, the health authorities. So the health authorities yeah. uh, needed to uh, unlock the app uh, for, for you, for, for that you could report. But the point is that um, uh, when uh, there was the, the peaks of COVID cases, the health authorities couldn't uh, contact uh, everybody. And so uh, all, mm, the, the majority of the people couldn't report themselves because uh, they, they, mm, they, they, they weren't in contact with the health authorities. So there was a, even a, a, an additional yeah, problem. Yeah. Then they solved uh, this uh, issue. But I think that uh, after the first wave of COVID, uh, almost nobody was using it. So um, it is, actually, I know a person who has been uh, contacted, who was quarantined That's by right. the app uh, <laughs> Immuni. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's true that um, it wasn't uh, used uh, so much. Okay. Actually, okay. it was quite used uh, in the UK and uh, it was uh, um, working uh, better there. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, also, uh, Lucas, as a question, please. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks, Julia, for the talk. Um, I didn't get uh, how do you decide wh whether someone has, is a false positive? Because I, In the I, I understand that your model is based on simulations, right? So how do you decide that? Yeah, the, mm, the, the, in the numerical simulation, we, mm, we, we <laughs> make the COVID spread, so we know exactly who is uh, positive and who is uh, negative. And uh, uh, then we, um, we see how many uh, of the, um, I mean, we, we see uh, which are the people that are quarantined and uh, all the, the infected that uh, yes. are not quarantined mm. are uh, false negative. And all the infect not infected that are quarantined are false positive. Yeah, no, that, that I, I understood. The Absolutely. thing is, um, um, you have a, a, a model, uh, you have a simulation um, to simulate how, how the virus spreads, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to fix uh, certain parameters there. Uh, uh, so there's a, you have like a prior in your model that, that's, that tells you, you know, how likely it is to get infected if you are closer to a certain range and for some period. But, and then if, you know, if you're using that prior to analyze, you know, how many um, false positives there are in your, in your results, according to the distance and, and time, and then you make um, decisions accordingly, it's like um, you can't validate. It's, it's, it's a, like a self-referential thing. You, you cannot, you only, you're only validating whether your prior is, is consistent with your results. Because at the end of the day, nobody knows how, how long you need to be exposed to the virus. It's, that's not something yeah. that epidemiologists know, right? So, so for me, it's, very difficult to understand how can you validate whether someone will be a false positive or false negative in a realistic uh, environment. Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, and I, I show again the slides. Um, so, um, yes, uh, the point is that uh, uh, we um, are, um, uh, first of all, we, we tried uh, um, two different uh, uh, models of uh, infectiousness and we saw that the results were very uh, similar. So we, um, uh, from, from the mathematical model point of view. 
um, for, sorry, not, not for, from the mathematical model, but for uh, beta of tau. And then for the, uh, the part which is more delicate, uh, which is the beta exposure and beta dist, uh, because of course we, we define them. For beta exposure, for the um, dependency on duration, there are some mod models in literature, so we relied on them, but for the distance, there were not. So we, we, we just um, uh, consider different scenarios, as I was saying before, so, for instance, here you see that there is uh, the, um, the blue curve for the exposure, which is the most uh, uh, pessimistic case. And for the distance, this corresponds to the most optimistic. And so, we, if we combine, the, we, if we use the two blue curves, we obtain at, at the end the same uh, um, reproduction number as using the two yellow curves or the two pink curves. So we uh, considered um, different scenarios for these uh, different possibilities for these um, curves um, in order to have uh, to reach a certain reproduction number. And actually, we uh, set uh, also the parameters in order to have uh, an R0, uh, which was the one of COVID when uh, no, no isolations and tracing uh, are at play. So in order to, to have a realistic uh, situation, we, we set our R0. And then uh, we consider different uh, possibilities for these uh, uh, functions. Okay, but, but, but again, my, my, my concern, I guess, it still remains, you know, because here in, it's a very good uh, plot, this one about inf infectiousness versus distance. This is the prior you're, you're putting in your model. So if you say, um, let's say, if you, if you assume that infectiousness falls very, very quickly, Mm -hmm. with distance, then it makes sense that at the end of your simulation, if you assume that uh, the definition, I mean, if, you, if, you, if your policy is the one that uh, only takes uh, into account uh, um, being exposed, uh, I mean, for quarantine, I mean, mm -hmm. being exposed uh, for, you know, shorter than a certain range, or like, one meter, then then in, it makes sense that you will get not many false positives. But if uh, you know, if on the other hand, uh, you, you, this curve infectiousness versus distance is different, you assume a, a different curve, then your conclusion will be different as well. So yeah. you can't really validate. Yeah, uh, actually, or, the, the conclusions are not so different by considering the three different uh, curves. Uh, mm -hmm. since uh, we, we are combining the distance with the uh, duration. Um, to make a, a, a okay, I see. Okay, um, and, so, and then, uh, yes, you, you're right. That, that was one of our uh, concerns at the beginning. Um, the point is that, um, is more that, that we are um, sharing uh, a method to mm -hmm. uh, find uh, which are the, um, uh, the risk, the, the risky thresh, the risk, the thresholds of risk that we have to consider. But mm -hmm. of course, uh, um, if we had more information on uh, how the infectiousness uh, depends on the distance, uh, this could be corrected by, okay. I mean, by changing the cure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Very nice work. Thank you. Okay, I don't know, we are a little bit late. Uh, if there is one very quick question, otherwise I think we can, we can, uh, we can stop here. We can thank again, uh, again, thank again, Julia. I don't know, very quick, very, very quick, no, okay. Okay, since it's quite late, uh, thank you so much again, Julia, for, for the amazing talk and the congratulations for the work as Luca was saying, it's, it was really, really, really interesting. And nothing. So thank you again and see you next next week. Julia, also if you want to come for the next week seminar, you are invited. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for the invitation. Oh nothing. Okay. Bye bye everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you again.
stopping the recording.